maintaining this lifestyle while having kids, it's just always been treated almost like a non-issue. Like, this is mom. You know, mom is non-monogamous. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We always strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy and positive approach to non-monogamy. However, everyone approaches this a little different, and at its core, our show is about hearing and learning from the different experiences and approaches people have. With that in mind, it's important to remember that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of our own. It's also important to remember that we aren't doctors or therapists and that we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on this show. One final thing that we need to let you know about is that this podcast will hopefully include some explicit language. So, if that kind of thing offends you, we suggest you just keep listening until it no longer does. However, if you're under the age of 18, you should probably stop listening or gather up your parents and listen as a family. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 55! You know what my favorite part about 55 is? What? You already know because this is our second time recording. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I don't know. It's the first palindrome episode since episode 44. True. I was going to say, you, you, when you first said it, you said it was the first episode that it's the palindrome, but it's not. Since 44. Right. Okay. Anyway, that's Golly. 11 ago. Wow. Now that, now that we lost everybody. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. We're Finn and Emma. And today we have an awesome interview with Rapunzel. Yep. Awesome female uh, who has been to Desire. She's explored polyamory, swinging. She's a single mom. She's just awesome all around. Yeah. And we're excited to have it. One quick note on the audio here. I've listened to it a whole bunch of times. I believe yeah. everything is 100% audible. There is about a 10-second bit in the min- in the middle that gets a little goofy, but it clears up, and there's a little bit of, like, white noise, and I think it, it was, was rain, yeah. but I also think it's only on our side, and I was able to, basically every time she's talking, which is the shit you care about, I just muted us, so... Hopefully it's good. It shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know why I bothered telling you. I was going to say, <laughs> going very deep into this. <laughs> a quick reminder, we are going to be at Atlanta Poly Weekend. I was just going to say that. In June 7th through the 9th. So come visit us there. See us. Yeah. Read us. We're going to be hanging out there with, for a few days. So if you're anywhere near the area or want to, an excuse to go to Atlanta, it, come see us. Before we jump into the interview, two quick things. One of them is... Uh, two interviews ago, we did an interview with a couple who created the website Hashtag Open. It's actually an app. Yes. So go check out the app. Check out the interview if you want to know more about it. It's basically an open-minded, safe, all-inclusive dating app for yeah. people all over the sex-positive space. So yes, and they're trying there. to grow. So please go check it out, sign up, and see. It's something that we think is awesome. They're, they're doing some really good work. So. Yeah, and if you do sign up, you know what you get? Nothing other than an awesome profile, but <laughs> one dollar gets donated to Planned Parenthood for everybody who signs up, up to sixty nine thousand dollars. Yeah. So, go do that, and we'll maybe have another resource at the end of the episode, and we will see you then. Well. Well, what? Oh, we should probably mention. I was well, going to say it's the last week for the competition, or I should say giveaway for the fifty dollar gift card for SED check. So go to our website, click on the contest link, um, sign up, try to win it. You could also save ten dollars for your SED test by using the links on our website. So also do that. The website is normalizing non monogamy. Wow, this is why I usually <clears throat> say it. Normalizing nonmonogamy.com. And I'm sorry that I tricked you into thinking it was just. Anyway, let's go to the uh, interview. We're falling apart. <laughs> we are. This is not our best. <laughs> okay, All right, good. perfect. Well, then, without further ado, welcome mm-hmm. Rapunzel to the show. And I think this might be a world record for fastest turnaround from. Somebody who emailed us to somebody who got on the show just because everybody's <laughs> schedules aligned really fast. Yeah, so I think so. That's exciting. It's unusual for me, for sure. So, yeah, definitely very cool. 
Well, we feel honored. So mm-hmm. thank you for taking the time this evening to talk. And yeah, for anyone who doesn't know you and including us, I mean, we met you at Desire and we talked a little bit, but maybe fill us in a little bit on the background of who you are. Okay. Well, um, hello, I'm Rapunzel. I am uh, 41 and um, I am in the medical field. So I'm, I'm very much interested in the like sexual health aspect of um, just sexuality and, and, and associated with non-monogamy. I find it really fascinating. Um, like, should I, go, I could go into my history with the life, style, but it would take about a half an hour. So I'll give you the, the cliff notes. So, well, as much as much or as little detail as you want, and we can dive in deeper where you want and not where where you don't. Okay. Um, so uh, my history of the lifestyle started a million years ago, or at least it feels that way. Um, about a decade ago, um, I got involved with uh, my ex-husband and um, did things absolutely wrong and every possible mistake that we could have made, every possible wrong way, we did it. Um, that relationship ended. And uh, that, so that I was single and uh, and dating. And um, I had tried to get into the style with a few uh, people that I dated along the way. Um, one person I had a very significant relationship with and he accompanied me to um, Desire in, in uh, 2017. And, was that uh, your first time there? It was. It was. I had wanted to go for years, and um, 2017 was my 40th birthday, and I'm like, I'm going. <laughs> if you want to go with me, great. If not, <laughs> I'm going by myself, but I'm going. Um, so that was my first time there. Soon after that trip, that relationship ended uh, per his uh, decision. Uh, so I spent this past year being kind of solo poly. And um, exploring the relationship anarchy type model. Okay. Uh, I recently, uh, uh, recently, several months ago, started. Um, I met a man who uh, was a really fabulous connection, and we have been getting quite serious. He had described himself as being vanilla when we first met, <laughs> and I'm like, well, good luck with that. <laughs> And um, we attended his very first uh, lifestyle party this past weekend. So he's one of us. Wow, Ooh. that's exciting. He, he spent the entire hour and a half ride home discussing about how much fun it was and how awesome it was and the next steps. So I'm like, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> so yeah. He's not like a vanilla swirl. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I think he might have bypassed the swirl and just gone straight for all the flavors. So we'll see how it works out. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's exciting. And so backing up a million years ago, as you proclaimed yourself, how how did you and your your ex-husband get into the lifestyle to begin with? It was actually my idea. I had, uh, I was this, I was a conservative Christian for most of my life, and that's how I was raised. And somewhere around uh, 27, 28 years old, I, um, I started attending church regularly, and it didn't make sense to me. Um, and as I started re-examining my religious views, I started re-examining my political views, and then I started re-examining my sexuality views. It all happened within, like, a year's time, and I'm like, I um, don't think monogamy is right. Like, I want to sleep with other people. Yeah. I am interested in women. Um, and you were so married at this time. That, yes. So you know, I had brought that up. Uh, and so we had decided about a couple years later, we had decided to start like delving into it. And, um, we made the very classic mistake of our first experience being a female bisexual friend of ours, of his, of his, Uh and, uh, it went about as well as you can imagine. So it ended up with them, um, forming a relationship and, uh, I was very quickly pushed out of the out of the equation, and okay. then um, as we tried to like make our marriage work, because you know kids and everything, he became very unethically non-monogamous. Okay. So even though we were swinging <laughs> and you know open in that regard, um, he still became very unethically non-monogamous, which is what ended that relationship. So when you when you brought it up to him originally, how did he react? Because I would imagine. 
if you were going down this road of conservative Christian and then all of a sudden you, you kind of pull a 180, how how did he react to that originally? Um, it's a, a slightly more complicated than that, but um, I was actually, it was at the very end, I was married twice, it was at the very end of my first marriage when I initially brought it up and the reaction was very bad. Um, I was, it was actually my second marriage that I brought it up and said, this is something that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And he was very much into it. So some between the the transition between being married, my first husband and married to my second husband is when I went through my very, uh, significant changes and, and dropped the religion, dropped the conservatism and became the, the atheist liberal hippie I am now. And also became much more interested in non-monogamy. So when I did bring it up to, to my second husband, he was very much into the idea uh, and moved forward faster uh, than I anticipated. And he was the one that you experimented with uh, the friend, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. My first husband wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. So it was, it was my second husband. We experimented with his friend and um, really got kind of, uh, big into the traditional swinger environment around where we are. And what I discovered was it was uh, a little misogynistic around where I live. I do live in a a very kind of rural area where it's a very conservative area, a lot of conservative viewpoints. So it was really misogynistic. It was um, a lot of, well, you're at a swinging event, so you must obviously consent to being touched by anybody type of personalities. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I, I kind of put up with that. Uh, put up with is probably not the right term. Um, I kind of accepted that, thinking that that's just the way it was. Right. Because um, you didn't know any better, too. Because I didn't know any better. Right, right. That's how we got into it. And there was just, you know drama and people fighting at the parties and tears and um you know uh, one person in a couple talking to another person in a couple and and causing problems and there was just a lot of that garbage that I experienced for probably my first um five years of being in a lifestyle so uh, surprisingly I wasn't turned off to it I was gonna say that would would turn a lot of people off yeah Yeah. (laughs) Um, somewhere along the line is when I found life on the swing set. I don't remember where, I don't remember when, I don't remember how, but they've just been in my life for as long as I can remember. So I believe it was sometime after my marriage ended with the, the many, many affairs he had, but listening to life on the swing set is what made me realize that what I experienced my first five years in the lifestyle with my ex-husband was not how it had to be, was not how it just was. Yeah. Right. Because what I thought, I thought that's just how it was. And then I found, you know, swing set and I'm like, this is it. This is, these are, these are my people. And I actually don't have contact with anybody anymore um, from the early swinging days. Yeah, so those five years, you said you were going to parties, you had experimented with mm-hmm. that friend, and then your um, husband at the time kind of, you said, kind of moved unethical, into unethical relationships. Um, Sounds yes. like more than kind of. Kind, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah it was, it, there was there was several, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so that relationship ended, and then you found you said you found yourself on your own, and you mm-hmm. realized that... Yeah, like the, the five years you spent was not everything that's out there, right? So yes. how I guess, how did that make you feel? Did it make you feel like you, I'm assuming, like excited that it wasn't true, but also did you, were you upset about those five years that you experienced all of that? Or did you take some learning experiences away from it? Um, yeah, there was definitely an aspect of being upset just because of the circumstances that surrounded um, the end of my marriage and yeah, how, that makes sense. how right and how that type of lifestyle played into it. Was I upset that I experienced the inappropriate touching and the misogyny? Uh, yes, to a degree. However, I look at it as uh, more of a learning experience that um, you know this is out there, but 
it doesn't have to be that way. So am I upset that those things happened? On the surface, yes. Yeah. But I try to take the positive from them, um, from those experiences and apply it to uh, the person I am now. I mean, one thing that I absolutely learned from it is, is I learned how to um, find my voice Mm -hmm. and speak up when I'm not okay with something happening because that was not what I did then. I just thought this is the way it is, you know? Yeah. Uh, Had had you started to find that towards the end of the, that time where you said that you thought that was the way it was, but also that you found your voice through that towards the end of it, had you started to be able to speak up for yourself and, and shut shit down when it wasn't going the way it should have been going? Yes and no. I would make my feelings known, but in an unhealthy way. (laughs) I I wasn't mature and uh, mature enough to know and healthy enough because I was in a a state of just a constant anxiety and depression with the, the, you know, the bullshit that my ex-husband was, was pulling. So whenever I would feel uncomfortable, I'd speak up about it, but it would be in a very unhealthy manner. But the seeds were there that I was able to, uh, speak up when I was feeling uncomfortable, or at least acknowledge that I was feeling uncomfortable. Now I'm able to maturely say, why am I feeling uncomfortable? This is why I move forward. Then it was just, uh, break into tears. Right. <laughs> and be really unhealthy. Do you mind sharing where some of that shift came along and like, what, like, where did you learn the healthy way and and maybe what does that look like for for people listening um well i mean i went to um i went to some therapy then but i've also been in therapy for the last year and i feel like every adult should have therapy at some point in my life Mm -hmm. (laughs) or in their life in my life in their life but i spent a lot of time dating and um when you date a lot, I went on a lot of first dates, a few second dates, not many third dates. When you date a lot and you meet so many different people, um, I think you start, or I did anyway, I started to, every time something would go awry, I don't want to say wrong because it's not necessarily wrong, but you know, off the, the path I had envisioned, um, I would kind of examine why, why, what happened? Was it something they did? Was it something the way I felt? And I really just kind of started examining, um, how I reacted to situations and how other people, uh, reacted to situations as well too. So somewhere along the line and just meeting a lot of people made me better at, um, uh, kind of realizing human nature and, uh, uh, yeah. I just say, I would guess it would just be like meeting more and more people. And the more conversations you have with people, the more conflicts you have with people. Every time that happens, you, you learn more. Yeah. And yeah, you, I kind of went rambling there for a bit. But um, uh, yeah, it's uh, meeting a lot of people and just interacting. The right. more you interact with people, the more you learn. I also started going for my graduate degree as well, too. And what, one of the classes I had to take was a conflict management class. So uh, I would say that that probably helped as well, too. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like kind of similar to what we've learned is just a lot of practice. Like, yes. you, <laughs> you, you try it and then you see how it worked and then you tweak it a little bit and you try it the next time. And I right. Think, uh, yeah, a lot of these situations, even in a conflict class or uh, even, yeah, I mean, we're not really conditioned for the situations that we find ourselves in sometimes in the in the swinging world or in the world of polyamory. So uh, it's a lot of trial and error. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And you, you really have to be like honest with yourself. And this is what, you know, the, the, the therapy really helped too, is you have to be honest and look at the situation like, okay, well, this relationship ended. And whether that relationship was, you know, six months, a year or one night. Um, so this ended a why, you know, look at your actions. What did something I do cause that? Uh, did I react inappropriately? Did I react emotionally as opposed to um, logically? Yeah. So it takes a lot of self-examination. And I think that 
most people aren't able to, or they don't like the feeling that comes with self-examination because it, it requires you to uh, realize that, you know, maybe you were an asshole. <laughs> and I, I would think people by nature, they don't want to admit that they were assholes. So once no. you kind of get to the point, you know, yeah, that's what you need to do to learn, to grow. And I've been an asshole a lot. <laughs> I've never been, but I've yeah. heard. I've heard. I've never been an asshole. I don't even believe that. You know, we'll go with it. Yeah. It's our We're show. Yeah. <laughs> I think as long as you can reflect on it, and, yeah, for sure, and grow as a person, for sure. That's it. That's it. If you, you know, and I think that that Dylan and Cooper both bring this up on the podcast a lot too. Is they both freely acknowledge that they were assholes in the beginning. And they've um, examined their behavior and, and made conscious changes uh, to become, you know, the people that they are now. It takes a lot of uh, self, self-realization self to make that kind of statement and that acknowledgement that you were a bit of a jerk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also, you know, give yourself a little bit of, forgive yourself a little bit too, because you're, yeah. you're we're all just human trying to navigate this, these things and, you don't want to be an asshole or hurt somebody else, but sometimes that may happen and you need to, you know, yep. say, so, you know, obviously say sorry or whatever you need to do apologize, but also forgive yourself. I, I discussed that with, with my partner that, um, I, I am becoming serious with and I say, I will do my best to never intentionally hurt you, but you know, I am a human and you're a human and we're going to hurt each other. And when it happens, it's just essential that we acknowledge it and uh, kind of self-examine as to what happened and, and be remorseful and right. then grow. Right. Because we're all humans. We're going to inadvertently hurt each other all the damn time. Yeah. yeah. That's a job. <laughs> right. So I was wanted to back up to when, so when you opened up your relationship, it sounds like it was pretty early on with your second husband that that you opened it up and then like this was really your first attempt at at trying an open relationship whether it was poly or or swinging and it didn't work out right i mean it went down the road that you obviously don't want to go down where rather than doing it ethically and as a team you've got Mm -hmm. someone cheating and going behind your back was there a point after that that you were like being open is what caused that and maybe that was a mistake and this relationship style is not for me or did you were you pretty was it pretty easy for you to look at that and say this wasn't a a problem with the style it was a problem with the person um i would say that uh during our relationship i thought that the problems that he and I were having, uh, because our, our relationship was very turbulent and, you know, he would, he would leave and come back and leave and come back and leave and come back. And we were always fighting. Uh, during mm-hmm. that time, I was convinced that it was swinging that was causing the problems. It wasn't until after he left and didn't come back, which is probably like, I don't know, the seventh, eighth, kind of, I don't even know. Uh, he left and didn't come back. And I was, uh, distraught that a couple of girlfriends who I actually met um, with him as in, in a swinging environment as swingers, they were swingers too, that they pointed it out to me that they said, you know, this isn't swinging that caused the problem. It was him cheating and lying that caused the end of your relationship. So yeah. So, yeah in the midst of it all, I said, no, no, if we just stop swinging, it'll fix everything it wasn't the swing he was cheating um so i was definitely able to to realize that after some friends who who were also swingers pointed it out to me as that relationship ended the majority of the people that we had met through swinging kind of came to support me now whether or not they were being supportive because i was now a unicorn i don't know but a lot of them were there to um you know be supportive um I did date somebody for about six months, about a year or so after my, my marriage had ended. And he was adamant that 
relationships could not uh, withstand swinging. Um, and didn't want me to have any contact with my swinger friends. And uh, you know, he, he, his evidence, as it were, was to point out that my marriage ended because of swinging. And um, obviously, that relationship didn't last. Yeah. But um, I would explain to him that it's you know it wasn't the swinging that ended the relationship. It was the uh, the lying and the cheating that ended the relationship. Uh, so once that relationship ended, I never had any desire to go back to monogamy. Right. And and then you so you said then you sort of shifted to a solo poly route and I guess do you mind talking a little bit about that versus sure. the solo poly route versus being a single female exploring the the swinging world or or was it a little bit of both? Well, um, I don't actually like being the unicorn. I don't like being the the single bi female uh, in the swinging scene it made me feel kind of like I was prey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. Um, people felt very predatory to me, like, oh, single bi female, and they like, come in on me. So while I went to a few events with swinger friends, I never really played because I never felt comfortable. Yeah. With regards to when I was dating and kind of the solo poly thing, that was mostly in this in this last year. You know, there was, you know, it's, all the lines are blurry. So I could say solo poly, I could say say relationship anarchy. What I did like to do in this last year was I, I, I did back up. I did have a, a very significant relationship that I, I thought was going to be my like final main relationship. Uh, the, the partner I went to Desire with in 2017. Um, and we had gotten into the lifestyle together. He, I brought him into the lifestyle. Um, after that relationship is when I started relationship anarchy. And what it really became was more connections that I made with people. Some of them at desire, some of them not. There was a lot of love there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved them. They loved me. And there was a sexual aspect to the relationship. There wasn't a whole ton of romantic aspect to the relationship, only because I'm not a very romantic person. <laughs> but um, <laughs> some of my friends just call me a big old curmudgeon. But um, <laughs> <laughs> these people that I developed relationships with, they showed me in this past year, both as I recovered from the ending of that significant relationship and just as I dealt with the bullshit of, you know, raising kids and being in school and, and working and running a house and being single woman here, the stressors of life, they, these people who loved me came, came out in, in, to support me in, in, in these incredible ways, phone calls, text messages, um, Several of them came and visited me and they were all like, we love you, uh, Rapunzel. You can, you know, Mm -hmm. you can do this. We're here for you. So a lot of the desire people did that. And then I had a few people with whom I had started relationships here um, locally who, who did the same thing. So to see these, these humans who cared about me so much loved me so much and some of them flew across the country just to spend a weekend with me because I was struggling yeah um, was something I had not experienced before that level of just outpouring of love and each relationship with you was unique each relationship had its own um, aspects to it that were amazing and fantastic and I could spend the time with that particular person and and um, appreciate those aspects and then spend time with another person and appreciate those aspects. And everybody brought different things to these relationships. One of, you know, I had a relationship with um, uh, another medical personnel. So a lot of our, a lot of our time together would be, you know, just discussing my, my grad school. I, uh, another relationship was with people who really loved craft beer. So, uh, you know, our relationship, our time together would be spent at, you know, breweries Uh going in and exploring beer. So I loved that because while I was still dating and I still would have loved to find at the time, you know, find that person that I would 
be a life partner with. I wasn't in the mental state where I could, was ready for that. So to have all these incredible people in my life who shared varying aspects of what I'm passionate about, and they might not hit them all, you know, they, they wouldn't hit all my passions, but that they could come and spend a weekend with me exploring beer, exploring whatever that I'm passionate about is just amazing. And our time together was um, fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, like I said, a few of them were local. Most of them were desire people. And I, I just felt incredibly loved by each and every one. So it sounds like the trip to desire in 2017, even though you went with a partner that you're no longer with, it sounds like it was very transformational in the people that you oh. met. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, whenever, like I said, I don't remember how swing set came into my life, but I knew that I was listening to my people. And when I walked onto the resort, um, you know, through those sliding glass doors and I knew that I was with just my people and, uh, my, my kids asked me, um, you know, how do you know all these people? How are you so close to all these people? And I'm like, you know how you go to summer camp? Because my kids have been going to summer camp for a million years as well, too. But you go to summer camp and you, you spend a week with these people and they become really good friends and you maintain these relationships with them, even though you only spent a week with them. And they're like, yeah, like it's like that for adults. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but something about that place particularly with the swing set group is you kind of know you're going with people who are a similar mindset already. So you can almost bypass all of that uh, early getting to know you bullshit because you know that you're going to mesh on a lot of your core values that you can go and kind of jump right into really intense relationships with them, significant yeah. relationships with them. Right. And one, one thing I wanted to bring up, too, and you've mentioned it now a few times, is you you have kids, it sounds like multiple kids, and you're, a, a, I guess, a single parent at this point. How are you able to manage the going to, you know, managing going on all these dates and also being able to go to desire and I mean it's financially taxing it takes a lot of time it's there's a lot of things and I think people listening and in, in they hear us talk about it and and you know we're we were two income no kids we it was pretty easy for us relative to a lot of people to be mm -hmm. able to go but for people who have a lot more obstacles I mm -hmm. mean how how are you able to make it happen two years in a row and, and are you going a third year? Well, I mean, I've got a lot of BDSM gear, so I've got to go on good restraints because I just tie them up with a bowl of water and food. They're usually good for me. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> I know I have really great co-parents. Um, while my ex-husband and I, our relationship did not last um, and he was a horrible partner. He is a classic dad. And I have maintained a really good co-parenting relationship with him. Oh, that's good. So, yeah. So when I'm gone, they are with with him um, and his partner. Uh, we actually do things kind of as a family. We try to maintain a really good relationship. We have daily communication. We don't stick to this whole, like, well, it's my custody week and your custody week. We don't stick to that because we realize that working together is better for the kids. So, so that's how I'm able to do that. As far as financially, I am extraordinarily privileged and fortunate to um, have a career that is pretty financially stable. Um, I fully acknowledge that, that I'm very privileged uh, in, in being able to afford the trip. But also, I do a lot of, you know, cutting where I can drive older cars, you know, not have a huge house. Yeah. Um, buy clothing at second hand. Uh, so because I have made priority go and um, to, to go to, to desire to have these these things in my life. Yeah. I know that for my own mental health, health, 
yeah, mental health, particularly living in a very rural, very Confederate flag waving outside the house type of area <laughs> that I'm unfortunately here for a few more years, that I need to get out of here and make a prior home and be with my people. So yeah, desire is a huge, huge expense. But I think it's important to 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 state that like that I afford it for many reasons, being being privileged and then in having a good career, but also in making the conscious decision that this is something that I need to have in my life. Yeah. yeah. And uh prioritizing it. And yeah. it's other if I didn't that you know, that was it wouldn't happen. Right. Yeah, we we totally agree and you know, for us again it, it's it's slightly easier without having kids and everything, but it's still a priority we choose to make. It is. It's a huge priority. And yeah, for years and, and years, we said, no, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it. And then we did it. And it wasn't any cheaper. But at this point, it's something that, like you said, it, it's it's a huge mental health reset for us both. Oh, and, yeah. And relationship reset, too, in a yeah. lot of ways. And so... You know, I think I think our goal and our dream is to find or create something mm-hmm. here in in the U.S. that that mimics that and and can provide oh, yeah. that at a much more attainable uh, price point for people. So keep that in mind. That's been discussed. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely been discussed by by several people um, that I've heard recently about about just coming up with something around. Just locally, that that is a little bit uh, less cost prohibitive. Yeah. You know, I, I'm fortunate that I live uh, I live ten minutes from a, a nudist resort. Now it's not a it's not a lifestyle resort, <laughs> but there's a section that uh, it's, a, it's a camping section that that most of the lifestyle people go to. Okay. Now, granted, it is again where I live, which is a little bit on the conservative side, but I've got a circle of friends who are who are expanding our 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 presence. Yeah. <laughs> and at least you have that something. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And at least I could be in the pool naked with some friends. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite the same. But yeah, if we could find something, if we could find something that was, that was uh, a less cost prohibitive, but still just as warm. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I yeah, and I, where it's cold. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, on the flip side, reducing the cost will We'll make it more inclusive for people, and that's the that thing would be the hope. That you know, that's the thing that I think we would love to see is some more diversity and more inclusivity in in terms of the the types of people that are able to make it. So, oh, absolutely. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to jump really quickly ahead to this year because you went back to Desire, uh, I guess, in the beginning of November again with Life on the Swing Set, and you mentioned you went as a single female and. I don't know if people might be wondering like how, if that's possible and how that might work, because I'm sure a lot of people think that you can only go to desire as a couple. Right. So, um, it was definitely a unique situation. So in 2017, when I was there with my partner, we had already booked for 2018. Okay. Uh, Cause it, you know, we went in 2017 and I'm like, this is the only time we're going. And by and like the third day, we're like next year when we come back. So <laughs> we were already booked. Yeah. I, I, you're probably chuckling because you probably did the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Common refrain. Um, so when my relationship ended, um, I had already had these, these relationships with uh, some of the people uh, associated with Swing Set and, and Desire. And I reached out to them and said, listen, I know I have this room booked. I, I know it's a couple's resort. What kind of options do I have? Mm-hmm. We went through a bunch of different options, like, well, you can come as a third in the triad and whatever, and back and forth. And it, the stars kind of aligned, actually. I reached out to uh, Char Travel and, and said to them, hey, you know, this is the situation. And they remembered me from 2017, said, I, I got to come back. Like, these people, uh, you know, half a dozen of the swing setters traveled to where I live in Bumblefuck just to visit me <laughs> to help me through this. Like, I have to come back and see these people and um char travel ended up writing back he's like you won't believe this we usually don't do this but another woman contacted me and she really wants to come but her husband has no interest in coming let me just put you in touch with her 
and uh, see if you hit it off. Um, we did. It was like we'd known each other forever. Wow. Uh, we immediately started communicating and uh, um, communicated almost daily for probably, I don't know, like March or April on. Um, first time we met each other in person was actually there at Desire. I was there first, and then she got there and ran up and gave her a big old hug. Um, <laughs> so they really worked with us and worked with me to be able to still attend. And I just, you know, when I explained to them, like, I, I realize these are the rules and I wouldn't ask you to break the rules for me, but what can we do? Because these people saved me Yeah. from, you know, I was in just, I thought, I thought the relationship I was in was going to be like my, my final relationship. Uh, so I was so far into a pit of depression after that ended and the swing set people, the desire people saved me. They came and threw me many ropes and helped pull me out of that pit. And I just said to, to char travel and the, and the people who ran the trip, like, I, I, I have to come. Yeah. I, I have to come back. So did you end up sharing a room with her then? The other woman? I, we did. Okay. Yep. We did. And we had a fabulous time. Now I'm a morning person. She's a night person. So I was usually asleep. <laughs> Which really sucks. And I know I listen, I've been binging your podcast and I listen to people over and over and over say like, my God, can we just be done and like get the action going and be done by 11, please? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, uh, I was actually just talking to my partner after our, his first party this weekend as I'm going on a side tangent now. Um, we didn't get home until like three in the morning. And he's like, can we throw a party that starts at like two in the afternoon? I know. <laughs> like, so yes. everyone's more awake. <laughs> right so she was more up and out at night i was up in the morning but we had a, a great time sometimes we hung out and did things together sometimes we went and did our own things but yeah it was it was really a wonderful time we coordinated a few theme night costumes oh, cool. <laughs> it, yeah, was, I, it was great i was curious and and we'll we'll jump back to your story because i have some other questions but now i'm curious logistically on how one does this because <laughs> like i would feel like like, oh, hey, I want to bring somebody back to the room. Did you just, like, did you hang the little sign on the door to be, like, <laughs> or were there designated no fucking times in the room? How do, how do you do this? I'm curious. <laughs> um, I only brought one person back to the room, and we just left the door open, so we figured if she came by, she could just jump in and join us. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, I didn't walk in on her with anybody uh, else at all i don't know if she i don't even know if she had sex in the room or if she did elsewhere but yeah it was uh i well and it also goes back to i wasn't very um i was very introverted this trip and it was more about making the personal connections and the emotional connections and and and, and uh fostering the relationships i had already established from the previous year than um the sex this yeah. year yeah. I thought like we were, she and I were all like, I'm going down single. We're going to be crazy. That girl's going wild. No, it was more like girls fall asleep at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it was tiring. It's exhausting there. It's wonderful. The most wonderful place, but man, is it exhausting. Well, it's a lot of mental energy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the conversation, especially for introverts, so it's yeah. like the conversations and, um, Sometimes I would put my headphones in and, and like the, one of the things that drained me was the oot, oot, oot music yeah. at the pool. Yeah. <laughs> I like, I want to be in a pool, but I want to listen to my music. I can't stand the party music. So I would often just put my headphones in and my big floppy hat. People would leave me alone. That's a great thing about swing set too. It's like almost, I would say, I don't know. What do you think? Like probably more than half of the people there identify as introverts. Oh yeah. I think so. Yeah. And they will come by and they're like, no, hey Rapunzel, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I just need some introvert time. And they're like, all right, cool. Like, this group never pressures you to talk and yeah. do things. If you say I need some alone time, they're like, all right, just making sure you're okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. But they'll stop and check in and make sure that yeah. yeah, make sure you're okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I've never experienced that with another group, but uh, it's because we're all dirty introverts, so we just all found each other, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, so coming back around then you've you've kind of explored the swinging you did some relationship anarchy you got yeah. into a, a very serious relationship that 
ended unexpectedly it sounds like and and then you went sort of back to having these people come in and out of your life that 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 saved you and now you're back in another relationship and it sounds like at one point you thought well that was going to be my final relationship and then there was some other relationships and I guess what do you see going forward because it sounds like you're still wanting to foster the desire relationships but now you've got another primary relationship I guess what does it look like for you in in your eyes going forward so so my partner and I um talk constantly 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 about our relationship and um how we're feeling uh how uh, our thoughts on what we want uh our future to be um you know where we see each other we constantly want to make sure that we're on the same page so what we have and like i said it was his first his first lifestyle party this past weekend and and talk the whole way home and talking mm-hmm. constantly about it too. It's just, and this is the recurring theme you're going to hear from every single person who's in non-monogamy is just communication, communication, communication. Yeah. So what we've established is that, you know, we see a future with each other for sure. And that is definitely something that we want to foster and that we are uh, working on. We, we see this, uh, <clears throat> we see a few, we see future plans that are like two years down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you know, where do we kind of want to be? But from the very start, I, I said to him, I have these people in my life who are very, very important to me. And I love these people and they love me and they were there for me in my darkest times. And some of them I have sexual relationships with some of them. I don't have sexual relationships with, but I don't want to lose any of those relationships. These people are way too important to me. And his response to that was like, I, I completely understand. Now, of these people, I, I don't really have, they're mostly, they're mostly long distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're around the country because uh, they're mostly desire people. So I said that, you know, the time that I spend with them is infrequent, <laughs> you know, a couple yeah. times a year at best and when those very rare opportunities come up i said i do want to spend time with them and his response to that was like you know i i understand i understand how important these people are to you um so as far as what i see for my future is i do see this relationship being a a, my primary relationship and and a, a long term uh relationship with him but the ebb and flow of my relationships with other people, these, most of the people from desire, they kind of take whatever shape, uh, whatever shape they're going to take. Um, sometimes I don't speak to them for a couple weeks. You know, sometimes I don't speak for them to them for a couple months, but when we come back together, that love and caring is always there. Yeah. I don't know if I've rambled completely off topic. It's entirely mm-hmm. possible. This is what I do. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, and, and then as far as, as far as uh, my partner and I and our uh, going into the lifestyle, one thing we've, <laughs> I always, I would joke with him uh, even leading up to this. I'm like, I'm like, listen, I am the world's worst swinger. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I don't go to parties because I don't like being a unicorn and they always go so late. And I'm like, this old curmudgeon lady said, but I love being in the atmosphere. I love being in this sexually charged atmosphere, this atmosphere where you could just, you could kiss people and grab their butt and, you know, talk about anything and not have to censor yourself. Um, and that's what I really, really like. And if sexual play happens and play happens with anybody, great. If it doesn't happen, great. So him and I moving forward, we're, Focusing more on um, being in situations like that with people that we enjoy, with people we don't have to censor ourselves around. And if we are in a situation where sexual uh, sexual activity or play of some sort arises, great. If it doesn't, great. It's yeah. still a good time. Right. We're we're going to the fetish flea. Uh, I think it's in February. So there's a pretty big swing set contingent going. Um, cool. And, uh, 
Yeah, I know, right? I'm, I'm super excited about it. Yeah, so um, he'll, he'll get to meet some of these people. Yeah, yeah, he will. And actually, next next weekend, we're going on a road trip. And on our way back, we're stopping and seeing some swing setters as well, too. So, yeah, he'll kind of get a little bit more of an idea of what I'm talking about. But he, he's, in, he's involved in a particularly nerdy activity where um, the people who are involved are uh, have relationships kind of like the swing setters do without the sex part, <laughs> without the making out and butt grabbing. But, <laughs> um, so he understands the importance of those. Yeah. Close uh, friendships and, and relationships. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so moving forward, whatever he and I are going to do. Um, so, so he was okay then understanding of you needing, wanting to go to desire this year. Cause it sounds you were yeah. in a relationship with him when you went there. Yes. Yeah. Um, before we, before I went, um, I introduced him to a few of my friends here who, um, are poly swingers. Those they're, they're swing setters. They've just haven't gone to desire yet. Yeah. Uh, for various reasons. So introduce them, introduce them to him. Um, and it was kind of cute. They kind of, they kind of checked in with him throughout the week and made sure he was okay. And, and it was, it, it was difficult. He kind of didn't want to hear about any, uh, anything that happened. Um, and so I respected that, but, um, yeah, he was okay. He understood. He's like, I, I get it. He's like, yeah. I understand with these people, what this place, what this trip means to. Yeah. And I said to him, like, I, I have to go myself. Like I would have loved to have him along but I wasn't ready. I had to do this trip myself to heal yeah. from, uh, from last year. <laughs> yeah. Right. Relationship ending. Yeah. I, so, think, well, I guess important question though, before you ask your next one, are you going back next year? Yes. I was <laughs> <laughs> I'm ridiculous. Because I was like, I told everybody leading up to it, I can't come back in 2019. I'm going to come back in 2020 because I'll be graduating with my master's. But I can't come back in 2019. And I think I made it like 14 minutes in before. No, it was even on the shuttle on the way there. And, you know, it was the last year when I went, everybody was quite awkward because nobody knew anybody. Yeah. And this year I went, I flew down with four friends. So we were there together. And then we took, there were other people who we knew from, from last year. So it was already a big party in the shuttle and it, I, on the way over there. I'm like, yeah, so next year. And we're like, thought you weren't coming back, Rapunzel. I'm like, yeah, I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so I already, I already, that was booked before I left. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of addicting, isn't it? <laughs> It is. And, you know, once you're on resort and you say the words next year, then I think you're legally bound. I don't know. But maybe they put that. They got recordings of you. You You can't, you can't not. It's the most, um, it's, uh, I I don't, I, I spend a lot of times in the, in the summer at like music festivals and I feel, um, I'm, I'm Rapunzel there too. And I, I feel, uh, myself there, but, not quite like desire gives that little bit of the extra push into uh just feeling my truly authentic unapologetically authentic self Mm -hmm. yeah and i can run around with a blinking unicorn horn on and be silly and goofy and yeah it's just it's you know people say like i don't know if i could be naked in front of other people or i could be that vulnerable or or what have you but there's no more accepting group of people in the entire world <laughs> to do yeah. that with. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I think and then you're hooked. Yeah. It's a drug. All the oxytocin that your body releases when you're there. Yeah. So um, it sounds like your partner now, depending where you're at next year, may go back with you. Oh uh, yeah. He's going to go back with you. <laughs> I, get, I get the down payment from him early, just in case. <laughs> right. <laughs> make him pay, make him pay in advance. <laughs> He, his like his thing he, he he does this really particularly nerdy thing and they have a yearly gathering as well too and he's like i can't it's like i was gonna only go one year and i, I don't know we're going i'm going with him i commit i'm like all right if you go do my thing i'm gonna do your thing um and it's like his fourth or fifth year and he's the same way he's like once you go uh, you yeah. can't not yeah yeah so as much as we could sit and talk about desire for another hour or two, <laughs> I, know, right? <laughs> I, I, I wanted to go back to the topic of your ability to do this while having kids and 
if you don't mind talking a little more about sure. sort of have you had conversations with them? Like it sounds like they've started to ask questions about uh, you know, where do you know all these people from? And and yes. I'm sure they've seen throughout your years a shift in in your emotions and in your mental health, whether it's from yeah. desire or people that have come in and out of your life. And have you have you started to have some of those conversations with them or I guess how do you handle that? So we never had and I say we, um, meaning the co-parents as well, too. I should back up. What has really shaped my parenting decision and my relationship with my co-parents was actually reading Sex at Dawn, um, mm-hmm. where they talk about um, they, they talked about early human civilizations and undetermined paternity and basically how the entire tribe was responsible for raising the children. So I've always kind of taken that approach now. Uh, since reading that, of uh, it really, it's the whole like it takes a village trope but i mean it's it's kind of true yeah so we've never had any specific sit down conversations um i've always been very we've always been very open about um the human body i'm i'm a nurse so uh that that's just par for, i'm a third generation nurse so it's really just par for the course you know around here yeah um open conversations about sexuality, open conversations about birth control, about relationship tr- uh, types, about gender. We have a big circle of, uh, of we, meaning the co-parents, we have a big circle of friends of, of who are of varying sexualities and genders and relationship styles. So my kids have been kind of in that environment for the last five years. And uh, they both have come out my, my two oldest ones, I have three, my two oldest ones have, have come out as being just non-heteronormative is probably the best way. Still questioning, but you know, they're kids. So yeah. Are they teenagers now? They, they are. Yeah. They're the two oldest ones are teenagers. Um, and our response was always okay. And they would come and ask us all kinds of questions and we would answer them truthfully. So when it came to my own sexuality, my own relationship, they, the one asked me flat out, they're like, uh, have you ever had sex with a woman? Are you bisexual? And, and I said, do you want me to answer that? And they said, yes. And I said, yes. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to them. So, um, I've talked to them about non-monogamy and ethical non-monogamy versus unethical non-monogamy and um, how you can hold a lot of love for different people and different people bringing different aspects into your life. So it's always been a constant uh, conversation. Now, I did mention that I was about 10 minutes from a a local uh, nudist place. They know I go there. Uh So... They, you know, they know that, that I have friends with whom, uh, I go to nudist places with. Uh, I actually had the honor of posing, uh, nude for an artist in, in New York city with my friends and, uh, they've seen those pictures. So it's always just been a non issue. And I think it's just always kind of, that's like been like, uh, that's just the way it is. So with regards to when I go to Desire, they know, they know where I'm at. I mean, they don't know the details, <laughs> but <laughs> they know that I'm in uh, Cancun with friends and we're naked <laughs> and on the beach in Mexico. And that's all they really need to, you know, really need to know. I don't go into details. Now, my, my policy has always been if they ask a direct question, uh, I will answer it with a truthful answer. I will ask them if they really want to know, because once they know, they can't unknow, and I'm not going to pay for that therapy. But <laughs> yeah, if that's, your, that's yes, your desire budget right there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not spending that on your therapy. Um, uh, the same with like going into my room. Like you know, I'm involved in in kink as well too. And I say, don't go into my room. We try to respect each other's space. We don't go into each other's room. But so. So with regards to what they know and, and kind of dealing, maintaining this lifestyle while having kids, it's just always been treated almost like a non-issue. Like this is mom, you know, mom is non-monogamous. Uh, they, they know the difference between ethical and non-ethical. Just mom is a nudist. Mom's got friends all over the place. So it's just a non-issue. 
mm-hmm. sexuality, gender. God, our country is so fucking backwards when it comes to um, yeah, yeah. That if you really they they try to hide they try to hide this from our our kids and oh we got to protect the kids like now there was some kind of bullshit for the like the macy's thanksgiving day parade had like a same-sex kiss happen on it and people were all up in arms like you we're put our kids our kids they don't give a fuck i was gonna say yeah <laughs> if they're growing up with it they think it's perfectly normal as they should right. exactly <laughs> like it's it's yeah it's it's our societal norms that uh that that are passed down from <laughs> i was gonna be kind of a little derogatory and say like people with their shoe with the stick up their ass but <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know it just gets passed down but when it really comes down to it is these kids they know so much more um about human gender and sexuality and relationship styles uh, than our generation ever did. Right. And yeah. if their parents would just talk to the kids and um, the kids, it's a non-issue to them for the most part. Yeah. It, it really, really is. I look at my kids in their high school and um, their high school, some of the, the, they have like a rainbow flag sticker uh, uh, indicating that's a safe space. And I, I look at my kids and their friends and these, these kids are so expressive of their of their authentic selves and um they feel comfortable coming out as trans or or uh queer or what have you and for the most part the kids are just like all right that's my friend so and so you know and that's just how it is so right then i got all rambly again but but (laughs) yeah it's just been a non-issue since the start it's just well, and I'm I'm curious too on the same sort of along the same lines of, you know, you you went through multiple divorces, and and I guess I don't yeah. know, are all the kids from one father? And I, not to oh. be super nosy, but I I'm, I guess oh, where I'm going with this is being able to be out about who you are in the world of non-monogamy and being bisexual and being curious of all these things, it would be very easy for your ex, you know, spouse to vilify you and for you to lose your, your ability to have shared custody. And I guess, how were you able to navigate that in such a way that you didn't get vilified and have these things targeted and taken away from you? My two oldest, um, they're from my first marriage, the marriage, um, that when I was the conservative Christian, I still chuckle when I think about that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) they actually don't have a relationship with their father because when they came out as gender questioning and sexuality questioning, he refused to accept it. So they made the choice to not have a relationship with him anymore. And I supported whatever decision they made. Uh Um, My youngest child uh, was from my second marriage. He actually raised my two oldest with me. So for all intents and purposes, he's their dad. Mm -hmm. And um, he's the one that that I got into lifestyle with uh, to begin with. So um, we share very similar viewpoints on on gender and, and sexuality. Um, they consider him more their dad than their biological father only because when they, you know, when they came out as, as gender and, and sexuality questioning, he was the one who said, okay, yeah, you know, whoever you are, I love and support you. Um, right. So with regards to being able to be out, it is because my kids made the choice themselves that they did not want to have a relationship with a parent who did not accept them for who they were. Okay. And I can imagine how horribly difficult that was for them, but I'm proud of them for being so self-aware at such a young age and making that difficult decision. Yeah. And not forming to please someone else. Right. For sure. And it, well, I was like, I'm sure it also helps to know that they have 
you know, their mother and also um, their, whether their stepfather, but more generally yeah. for, for their father, like they have that support system, right? So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and they have this wonderful support system of auxiliary adults in their life that uh, they know through through me, friends of me, mine, mm-hmm. friends of, of, of my co-parents who are, you know, queer or trans or what have you. So they have this really wonderful, wonderful support system of adults that support and love them for who they are. So while I'm sure it was very painful for them to lose that relationship with their biological father, there are so many adults who love them and think they're pretty badass kids. And they are pretty badass kids. Yeah. It sounds <laughs> I like could it. Never be, God, could you imagine being a teenager and in high school being that authentic? I, like, God, as I tell them, like, it took me until I was 36 years old to be able to be my authentic self. <laughs> yeah, but now you've sort of set the set the stage for them to do it much earlier. So I think that's probably a reflection on yourself that, that they were able to do that, right? If they so. had to feel comfortable for that. And I, I think yeah. that's, that's fantastic. And, Thank you. and also I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very fortunate too, that all the stars align that, you know, even though your second ex-husband, although he, his, his ability to practice ethical non-monogamy <laughs> may have been flawed. His, his heart seems to be in the right place. <laughs> when yeah. It, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd say that that is that is definitely accurate. He is, like I said, he was a horrible partner. We were horrible partners for each other. But when it comes down to loving those kids, he loves them right. and accepts them with everything that he is. And I couldn't ask anything more from a co-parent. Right. Right. No, I think I think that's amazing, and it it's amazing too that you know for you you've been able to have that in your life have kids in your life who are accepting and then have the opportunities to go and experience desire and meet the life on the swing set people. And yeah. everything is sort of shaped, you know, pretty nicely in the last couple of years. So I think that's, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very, very lucky. Very, very fortunate. Um, I credit, I, I actually, I credit life on the swing set um, for, a lot of people say like they changed their life and they they truly, truly did. They really taught me how to communicate. I actually just pointed that out to Dylan the other day that, um, that life on the swings that really taught me how to communicate. And that's, that's key to all relationships. Yeah. Especially yeah. yeah. the kids, my co-parents, everybody, everybody. So I'm very fortunate. Yeah. And along those lines of communication, and and also with you being in the medical field and being a nurse, how do you approach the the communication and the conversations around your your sexual health and your sexual safety with with other partners? And it sounds like you said you spend a lot of time in the in the world of dating and various different sort of capacities. And I guess how how did you navigate those conversations? So it's, it's, it's funny, actually. Um, this, so this past weekend, like I said, was my partner's first party. It was actually the 40th birthday party of one of my very, very dear friends and occasional partners. Mm-hmm. And um, we wanted to do, she wanted to, this is her, credit all her. She wanted to do a play party that was very um, unique to what's usually around here, the traditional swinging, very much like you would see uh, in swing set and and, you know at desire and she and i demonstrated uh how to give an elevator speech and how to negotiate a scene because uh, an elevator speech is is something that i feel strongly about an elevator speech and an elevator speech is um which i'm sure you guys know but i don't know if other people know is that Mm -hmm. the speech that is uh concise that you can give from the time the elevator leaves the lobby till you get up to your room and it outlines your sexual health what your okay with and you know what you don't want to do so you know while i was dating um if i was i you almost almost i say almost exclusively but i think it might be 100 percent of the time was the one who actually initiated the do you want to come back to my place i had a really good line too um <laughs> wait, 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 wait what was it hold on what was the line so um i would if things were going really well 
I would just kind of leave it a little bit and say, I, <laughs> I can't do it now without laughing. Um, I have this really good Pennsylvania whiskey back at my place. Would you like to come try some? I have a hundred percent success rate. I mean, come on now. Sometimes we would hit the whiskey, sometimes not. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but when it would go to to do it time for the elevator speech, I would would actually do the same thing. And you know, people people say, oh, doing this talk and talking about sexual health isn't sexy. I'm like, oh, you just need to learn how to do it. And I would again lean in and just be like, have you ever heard the term elevator speech? And almost always they'd say no. And I'd say, well, it's the speech that you can give somebody to outline what you're up for and your health from the time the elevator leaves the lobby till you get to your room. And at that point, they're already intrigued, right? Yeah. So I would just at that point then switch into nurse mode, <laughs> actually, and um, do the rundown of, you know, here's my sexual health. Here's when I was last tested. I have a, a, a fluid bonded partner. They were tested at this point. You know, this is what I'm okay with. This is what I don't like. I require these barriers, yada, yada, yada. One of the things I kind of take seriously as, as a, you know, a nurse and, and somebody who's kind of been in, in the non-monogamy scene for a while is, is an educational aspect. So when they would come back to me and I would say, well, how about, how about you? And if they would say things like, well, I was last tested so-and-so and I'm clean, it rough them as, hey, just so you know, you know, by saying clean, it's kind of a, uh, makes somebody who might have some sort of uh, infection uh, feel like you're implying they're dirty. So, you know, trying to just kind of educate people. Um, just use I different only, terminology. Yeah. Right. Because language matters. And I so only, rather than clean saying negative. Negative. Hmm. Right. So I was tested for all of these and they were all negative. I only ever had one person kind of push back against it and say, this is really making things not sexy. And I was at that point, I just say, well, all right, sorry, <laughs> you're lost. <laughs> so, so, some damn good whiskey you're missing out on. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, the same with like, with consent, like I would almost always would lean in and say, may I kiss you? Um, and that same person was like, asking just takes away. You should just go for it. Like, no, nah, it doesn't work like that. Like, yeah. Especially in this, this age, you know? Yeah. I'm to the point where I try to teach my kids. Like if somebody's like, Oh, give, give so-and-so a hug. I'm like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to hug anybody. You don't want to hug. It's, it's education. Always, yeah. always education. And And so just to recap on that, of all of the, and I don't want to like make it sound like it was hundreds, but of all of the, pe- <laughs> of all of the people that you pulls out my list, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a it's a scroll. I was like, we all have that list, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this? How do you <laughs> Yes, but of, but of all the people you had those conversations with, you had one who pushed back on the consent and on the talking about the the elevator speech. Is that yes? That's pretty I'd, amazing. I'd say I'd say then it's worth having, right? If yeah. if you've got one yeah. out of even if it was one out of ten, you're yeah. still doing fine. Yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, not really have not to, you know, continue to go back and and uh fangirl a little bit, but it was it was the swing set that even taught me that. That yeah. that taught about the elevator speech, that taught about the welcome circle that taught about how to even make that communication happen yeah yeah and, and i would argue the point too that the the people who bow out at that point that's a that's a win for you right I oh, mean, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not losing at that point you're you're winning you're you're you've learned what you needed to know about that person and their ability to communicate and and be safe and healthy and yeah Better yeah, to go home I'm, and drink your own whiskey than Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is really good whiskey. Um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's that whole thing where they say if you reveal one thing about yourself and their reaction reveals everything about them that you need to know. Exactly. You know, that's just not something I need to partake in then. And I would definitely say this kind of goes back to to how I was uh, in the traditional 
swinging uh, scene my first five years and then transition to this person now, I can say back when I was that type of swinger, these conversations didn't happen. There were no elevator speeches. There was no talk of last testing. Hell, I would say that most of the people either weren't tested or had been years since they were tested. There was no communication about what was okay. And the type of person I was then just went along with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I look well, back it's, at ha- it's hard to push up and say something in those situations, well, right? Yeah. It's not easy. Oh, absolutely. For sure. It's, you know, and I'm not saying that it was necessarily bad or wrong. It's just, yeah, it's very, it's very difficult to speak up and, and, and say something, um, in those type of situations. And I think it's just a lack of education, lack of communication. And if I hadn't found the swing set community, I would still be that type of swinger. And they can each do their own thing and that might be great and work for them, but it doesn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. So if I had not found, if I had not found this community, I would say I would probably not be in the lifestyle in any capacity. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. And and I think too, unless you have something else, major you want to get out there i i think leaving it on that note is a good place because it, it kind of summed up a little bit of everything that we talked about other than go to desire it's awesome <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know this whole episode i think that they, I everyone got the picture right <laughs> We're not paid no. by desire in any way, shape, or form. It just it happens to be because life on a swing set was very um, fundamental in our journey through the lifestyle as well, and so uh, that's just how how it happened. And um, that, yeah, we can't say <laughs> enough about the, that trip. But then again, it's not for everyone, and it's not I, for everyone. You want to find have my hope is that everyone can find their people right whether it's life on a swing set but maybe that's not it maybe there's somewhere people. else exactly <laughs> exactly yeah, the, the importance of community oh, is, yeah yeah um, the community that they're looking for yeah it's it's all about finding your tribe when you find your tribe and you feel like you're finally home it's uh unlike any other ex- experience and whether the, that tribe is the swing set or whether it's you know the traditional swingers or whether it's my partner's nerdy group of friends and yeah. their activity when you feel home it's uh it's amazing and you make it a priority to feel that as much as possible exactly i think that's a wonderful way to end it on and thank you so much for spending the time and reaching out to us and, yeah. and fitting us into your schedule really quickly <laughs> well, i'm glad it worked out yeah as are we and um yeah just uh, as emma said thank you for everything and for your time and we look forward to seeing you in november i'll be there (laughs) okay thanks again all right bye thank you good night all right we've recomposed ourselves for the outro we're back thanks to rapunzel she's amazing and we're so happy that she reached out to us and we're excited to see her live in person at desire this fall November 2019. Woohoo! Yes! Spoiler alert, we might be going back to Desire. We are going back to Desire if everything goes as planned. Well, anyway, one way we're going to get there is by using Scott's cheap flights to buy our airline tickets. Nice. They don't pay me to say that, but that's definitely how we're going to get our airline tickets. Go check them out. And the other thing we're going to do is save lots of money this year by budgeting better using... Personal capital. And now... What are we doing next week? Who do we well, talk first, go check out the links on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Next week, we have an interview with the one and only Dylan Antonia. The one and only. From Life on the Swing set, I heard. Yeah. I heard yeah. that's where they're from. Okay. Well, that one I think is pretty good. I hope it's good. We did it, and I <laughs> yeah. edited it. So. It was a lot of fun to do, so I'm no. sure. It is pretty cool, because I think this is the first time we've really heard that story in its entirety as well. Yeah. So... Come in, check it out. We'll see you in a week. Bye, everyone.